Welcome everybody. This is uh, Tips for Framing with iJoyce, um, you know, presented by Fine Home Building. And uh, we're, we're proud to be working on this webinar with uh, the folks at Warehouse of Trust Choice. Um, so let's start there, Steve. Um, you are our, our first uh, co-host. Can you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself very briefly? Uh, yeah, so I am a territory manager for Trust Joyce Warehouser. Uh, basically, I work in the Mid-Atlantic region for the greater Philadelphia market. And my sole responsibility is to work with uh, specifiers, um, general contractors, and other sales reps, as well as inspectors, to make sure that you're installing to the best practices and uh, building the best homes that are out there. Great. Um, ben, why don't you just give us your, your real quick bullet point here? Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Bogey. I'm a principal and production manager for Building Performance Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, I have worn a tool belt for about 23 years before I switched to being a laptop and a cell phone. Uh, and I did everything from footings to finish work. All right. Like a bit of framing with eye joists in there. Does anybody think Mike needs an introduction or should we just skip that? Well, how about I just introduce when I started working with eye joists back okay. in the back in the uh, mid 1980s and they were just like what are these things and a customer a client had said i want to use these um heard good things about them going back to the 70s and uh we were all scratching our heads and making stuff up because the instructions were were not uh as good as they are today so we'll right. talk about some of the tips that i picked up over the years and maybe some of the mistakes <laughs> Um, and everybody, you probably just saw Aaron Jones's name pop up. He's, we have to forgive him. Um, he might have a little bit of connectivity problem, um, living the island life, um, and uh, with all the storms passing through. So, Aaron, it sounds like you came in at the exact right moment to say hi to everybody and uh, just tell us where you live and what you do. Uh, Aaron Jones, I am a carpenter and a builder on Grand Manan Island in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, we're... A general contractor, we do renovations, new construction, and try and do a little bit of high performance building somewhere in between there. Beautiful. Well, um, we've got a great crowd tonight. We're just shy of 100 participants, which is awesome. Um, this is going to be a really fun topic. Uh, we, I mean, this could not be a better group of panelists to talk about this subject, so I'm super excited. We're going to cover a lot of stuff tonight, um, but I really want to encourage everybody to feel free to chime in with questions. We might not stop in the middle of the presentation to answer the question, but rest assured we are keeping track of them and we're going to leave some time at the end to make sure we go back through and, and try to discuss some of those things. So, so don't be shy. You can use either the, the chat box down below at the bottom uh, or the Q&A, whichever one you're most comfortable with and want to want to uh, chime in via. Um, uh, my name is Justin Fink. Uh, I'm going to be, if you haven't figured out, your host for this. Uh, my job is going to be very easy because these guys are the best of the best. And I'm going to I'm going to do the right thing here and just try to shut up for most of this and just let them uh, lead the way. Um, so with that, why don't we just kick it off, guys, and get started? So why don't I share my screen as Ben suggested so that I've got it's not really a PowerPoint presentation it's more of a uh, just a collection of different slides so we can kind of go through some of the tips and i'll start off with the first one which is if if you've either worked with or haven't worked with trust joyce uh, when you look at the diagram in the the illustration in the uh, manual for installation guide or the installation guide it gets a lot confusing and it breaks everything down into different details which then the illustrations can get confusing. And what I found really helpful is there is a whole collection of their details that are done in video form on the the um, warehouse. I think it's the Warehouser's uh, YouTube channel. And you can find that on their website. And watching somebody make one of these connections uh, or how to cut the eye joist or any of that, it's so much more uh, it's like if a picture's worth a thousand words, a video's worth a hundred thousand words. So, enough said about that. Um, well, I just started... to, to add a thought, yeah. when you get into the like the the install guide, like at first it seems very daunting because there's all these details, but then as you start to kind of work your way through the guide, you start to realize that 
a vast majority of those may not even apply to your project. Mm -hmm. So you start to go through and like process of elimination, you call out all those details that don't actually apply to you. And then you're left with a handful that are relevant to your project. So don't be overwhelmed by it at first, just kind of start to work your way through it and it uh, becomes self-evident. And Warehouser has a great network of area representatives that'll probably like Steve be more than happy to come out to your job site and help you work through details um, as well and be a backup resource. Yeah, one thing that uh, I want to just bring to up as we got into this is, um, I mean, across North America, there's 53 others. I make 54 just like this. <laughs> um, eight of us are in Canada, broken up between the East and the West. And then there's 46 within the United States. Um, I'd like to see like in the questions or in the chat, how many of you actually know the names of your territory managers? Because if you are a trust choice user, you should know them. Um, we don't, we're not an extra cost. We're not, um, we are here to help do everything we're about to talk about today so that we can solve problems before they happen. So I threw up a slide just of some of the basics, uh, one of them being squash blocks. Um, load path is really important in transferring loads down. Squash blocks, we used to have to use them on every joist back in the old days when there was no structural rim board, where we were using three quarter inch plywood or three quarter inch OSB. Uh, but now with the structural joists, a structural rim board is not so much of an issue. But something to keep in mind is that wherever you're going to end up with some sort of a concentrated load, say it's a header, that's going around a uh, for a, a big patio door, and those uh, jack studs are going to be coming down on the rim board. Though the rim board could handle it, it's always good to throw in the squash blocks. And as far as cutting them, you want those to be about a sixteenth of an inch taller than the joist of the rim board. Something is counterintuitive for a lot of us, but that way those squash blocks take the load and the framing uh the eye joist or the rim board isn't uh, isn't burdened with the entire load you'll actually see it in the bottom right picture there a little bit that the rim board's actually uh like a 16th to an eighth proud of the eye joist itself and that's done on purpose so that it's taking that compressive load from the wall plates above it or whatever the loading is above it um you know which at first is confusing you're like do i make these flush on the top or do i set them down on the plate but what you do is you let the the eye joist sit flush with the bottom and that that rim board sticks up above the joist a little bit to transfer that load instead of it bearing onto the joist itself yeah and one of the things to point out in both pictures is notice that they're installed now um i don't believe in rainy day work um putting squash blocks or what we call a cs detail this goes in now before it's loaded because there's no way to unload it to get the, the it, all the weights already has been pushed to the foundation. You're done. Yeah. Depending on the size of your crew and sometimes it's easy to have one person dedicated to hitting those point loads and making sure they're all dialed in. And if you're running a small crew, one, two people just, you know, you hit that point, put them in because you're right there. You don't have to go back. And it does take a second, if, especially if you're used to framing with dimensional lumber, you know, you're always flushing the top, flush the top, flush the top. So just got to retrain your brain for a moment to actually push that down on the plate below and just leave that 16th or an inch uh, or an eighth of an inch proud on the rim. Once my crew uh, installed our first uh, iJoy system and we learned about squash blocks and web stiffeners and things like that, back in the mid eighties, we started using squash blocks just in conventional framing as well. It just, it's, it's a good practice that translates to, to any framing job for transferring those loads down. Another one that people get confused on because there is a difference, uh, web stiffener versus squash block. Um, and web stiffeners are, I guess you could say it's pieces of OSB or plywood that are inserted in the web between the top and the bottom flange. And I can't think of any instance where you wouldn't follow the instruction, which is you actually cut it short about an eighth of an inch and you nest that squash block, depending on the situation, whether it's uh, for a, a rafter. Seat. I'm sorry. Squat. Yep. Thank you, Ben. 
you you <laughs> nest that the uh, web stiffener um, up against the the top of the flange, the, the upper flange. Okay, yeah, Mar uh, Steve's got a. So he's got. See how there's a little gap there. That's what you want to have. You don't want to be jamming or pressing those uh, flanges apart, uh, because once you, if you happen to separate that flange from the web, then you've damaged the joist, and then yeah, that's when you're gonna have to go to a secondary remedy for repairing that. Yeah, and when you went to that one detail where you showed the picture of the floor layout, web stiffeners are noted. If you go back, nope, keep going back to the original. Um, in that detail, notice that there's nothing in there that shows web stiffener. So except for on the cantilever, see where it says E1W on the upper left-hand corner? Anything that has a W notation is going to call out for a web stiffener. Um, if you're receiving layouts from uh, a one of our um, design staff, all of these will be called out on the, the colored layout to say what's a beam, what's a joist, and what these symbols are. And what's great about it is the symbol that's produced automatically produces a, um, a blown up schematic of what you're supposed to do at that point. And I think that gets to one of the, uh, one of the benefits of using a trust joist system is that we can drop off a set of plans with our local lumber salesman at the lumber yard. They're going to transfer that over to somebody at trust joist and they'll do a full layout for the whole thing and all those construction details. That on my end, uh, I'm, I'm generally handling pre-construction for our company. So I'll get uh, a specification from the engineer on the project that says, you know, 16 inch 560 series is going to work. But here are our live load and dead loads for any of these point load locations where we've got post downs coming down or uh, any particular load pass. And I then pass those on exactly to my lumber uh, rep. They send them to Weyerhaeuser and then it comes back with an engineered either reinforcement or squash block detail or something that we have to do for those particular areas. Yeah. I haven't done it for a while, but there was a time where we would send that in with notations of, hey, this is where our toilet's going to be. This is where our tub's going to be. And they would they would change the layout to accommodate those plumbing fixtures because there's nothing worse than your plumber comes in to do his rough in. and right smack where the toilet's got to sit you you've got a joist so they're very accommodating that way um and it's just easier to plan it now than try and do a repair detail after the floor is sheathed and since you bring it up there um regarding if there is something where a flange <laughs> gets you know damaged or or you end up cutting into it uh there is a technical bulletin from uh trust joist that handle for things that they can prescriptively tell you ahead of time. Otherwise, if it's something that's really unusual, you can get in touch with the rep and then they give you a detail. There are some products, aftermarket products on the market. Um, one's Metwood Joist Reinforcer, another one's the iJoist Notch Reinforcer. Not that I have any stake in any of these. I've used the Metwood uh, product when, yeah, a plumber Yep, we had to cut through the flange. And what do you do at that point, aside from slipping in another joist? So these are already pre-engineered. They have their ICC evaluation reports. So at least here in the States, we could use them. I don't know if they got a Canadian report to handle a Grand Manan or not. <laughs> I don't know about Grand Manan specifically, but I I believe the Skyline brand is approved Uh don't quote me on that, but I have seen something similar, if not this one, in use. And just to, to backpedal us a little bit back to basics here, uh, uh, th there's two real components to an eye joist here, which is the web, which is that central OSB panel, and then the two flanges. So you'll hear us throw those terms out and just so everybody's clear on what they are. You have your webs and your flanges. Yeah, good point. Jump back. Um... Back over to web stiffeners, those get end up getting used in a lot of different spots when um, basically we're, I find them mostly used wherever we're going to end up with some sort of piece of metal hardware. And, you know, at the end of the, the joist, there's going to be that sort of hollow spot where the uh, where the web is. And if your hanger does not go all the way to the top of the upper flange, 
it's not going to trap that and keep it from rolling, cap, trap the joist and keep it from rolling. So those web stiffeners go in there to fill that space up. And that way the joist can uh, be stable inside of the hanger. So we've used them on um, uh, with rafters when we're hanging a rafter off of beams. And then also you'll find them used when you make a seat cut, depending on how, how the geometry of the rafter is is done to fill that space up um, so you got a, a, a actual more surface area for that uh, joist to be used as roof framing as a rafter and those those web stiffeners they're coming out of just the standard commodity materials so either 7 16 two layers of 7 16 half inch plywood or solid two by material generally what we'll do is if we're framing with eye joists we'll set somebody up and they'll batch cut tons of web stiffeners at the beginning of the day and then we have them on hand as we work our way through and you can see that in one of the guys on our crew was building a house a few years ago and we just yeah, took all the scraps of the window cutouts and door cutouts, and we just ran them through a table saw and then, yeah, just went to town. Or just, or just buy commodity OSB. We'll buy commodity OSB for those locations. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Yeah. Anything to note about that, Steve, or other places where we might want to utilize web stiffeners or utilize them properly? So once we get into 16 inch and greater, I think it's once we hit 18 inch, web stiffeners are always going to be required just because of the, the sheer size of the OSB panel that's between the flanges. Um, the other thing to note, um, both on the web stiffeners and on the squash blocks, um, there's very little nailing that needs to be done in these. When you're doing a squash block, we're talking one top nail, one bottom nail. That's it. Um, this might even be a little bit overkill um, going through with, it looks like that's three quarter inch uh, OSB, maybe a little bit thicker. Maybe they use rim there. Um, three nails for the most part uh, on a 11 and 7 eighths and uh, even 14 inch eye joist just in a row going top to bottom. You do two from one side, cinch them over if they go through, one through from the other side and cinch them over. Um, like my father always said, if you had to do it by hand, you wouldn't put that many nails in and you really need to, just because you have a nail gun doesn't mean you need to, you need to go to town on it. I'm going to throw this out there and you might, you might tell me different, Steve, but uh, a lot of times we'd set a stiffener using PL and then once both sides of the stiffener were on, three nails knocked one side over. We just use a nail that was long enough to penetrate through everything. That way you only had to clinch the one side. Yeah, and I, that's fine. I think a lot of times the reasons that we say one from one, one from the other, um, or two from one side is when you get into like the two by blocking, um, which would go into our 560 series, so that you're not putting going from three side from one side, three nails in a row. Like we say, once you split something, whether it's a squash block, a column, a built up column. Once it's squashed, you're done. You got to pull it apart and start over. It's not doing what it's supposed to. Um, a bunch of questions have popped up and I just want to hit this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. People are asking about like the overcutting of the 16th. Um, if we said to cut it flush, I'm going to guarantee that most of us as framers are going to cut it just a little short. Um, so by saying a 16th, I know the question came up, well, what do we do when it's an 11 and 7 eighths? One, if you're setting it up on a miter box, you should be able to get repeatability and it should work out just fine. I know like that 11, 16 or 13, 15, 16, so I'll get there, um, is like questionable, like where should we be? If you're a 16th to an eighth, it's going to take the compression. You also have to think about the squash blocks that you're using are um, two by four and two by six in most cases there's a good chance they're going to shrink down a little bit as the house dries out. Um, as long as you are that 16th to an eighth, that's where we really want to be. You don't want to be flush or short. Steve, and, uh, I think one of the questions, though, that came up is when you're setting your, your eye joist on the sill and then you're butting your, your rim up to it, is that rim exactly the same size as the eye joist or is it uh, by nature of your manufacturing process, a 16th of an inch taller, the rim. I wouldn't say it's a true 16th. Sometimes it is. I mean, it, we work within 16ths 
in the manufacturing industry for this. Um, it really, it really depends. It, if you have, if you get, let's put it this way. If you get rim that is shorter than your eye joist, that's a problem. If right. you get eye uh, rim that is a lot taller, <laughs> that's a problem. Um, flush is going to be acceptable, um, but typically our beam type material or our rim type material is a true number. Um, so you may have, it's gonna be packed out a little yeah. bit wider. Yeah. You'll see it, we see, var we see variation as we're setting it. And sometimes as we're um, laying out, we'll swap rim material. You'll find one that's just extra heavy and you know, we'll either rip a little, you know, half a blade width off of it or something like that. But, you know, it's not an exact science. This is, you know, I hate to say it, but this is framing. We're not building a piano. It's it's really no different than if you went and grabbed four two by 12 from the lumber yard. Two might be identical. One's going to be a little bigger. One's going to be a little smaller. Um, you know, I would hope to think we're a little better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're not we're we're not sending a, a space shuttle to the moon here, but I do agree with you. It it's not like doing a deck out of treated. It's not no, no. we're going to be within those sixteenths tolerance in most cases. If you start getting where you start seeing like quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, half inch things going out, you need to reach out to your local trust choice engineer or to your uh, tech rep, and it could be that. It was a bad batch. I mean, they do slip through. When I say bad batch, maybe the saw blade had a little deflection in it as it was going through the mill um, and it wasn't caught by the sensors. But the more input that the people on this call or the framers that are out there can give back to Trust Choice and Warehouser, we can fix the, the issue a lot quicker or just check to say, hey, did any more material go out or was it just a really a fluke bundle? Because um, you have to remember, all these bundles have date stamps. They have uh, mill stamps. They have time. We basically know who was working on the line during that hour when that eye joist went by them. Yeah, so they get blamed. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what I think. Typically, the worst we've ever seen is about 316. Sometimes it feels like it's trending towards a quarter. But, you know, when we start seeing, you know, a heavy eighth, that's when we're starting to pay attention to how we're laying out. So and that's in infrequent. I jumped over to this picture because uh, Dan asked a, a, a basic question, which is uh, our web stiffener is always required under bearing walls. And, and here, this, this photo is of um, somebody putting in the panel blocking between the joist over a center beam. You can't really see it because the camera angle, but there is a center beam under that. Um, and it's I gonna don't look like it's gonna yeah. look like this when yeah. it goes in. Okay, so and and here's where I, I'm. I don't remember because I kind of work off the plans and what the um, I joist engineered plans are going to spec, as opposed to going and and just looking at the instruction manual. Um, when we have, if if this was a case where there's going to be a bearing wall resting on top of that line of panel blocks where uh it'll be carrying say a second floor or a roof bearing on top of those joists at that point do we need to put the web stiffeners in addition to the panel blocks or are the panel blocks enough to transfer that load um it's going to be called out on the the layout if you need web stiffeners okay what's interesting is the panel block can be replaced by what we call a CS detail or by putting a two by four or two by six, whatever the wall above is. Yep. Um, a lot of people are like, yeah, this is great. Let's use the cutoffs because we know that there might, there's gonna be waste. Um, I always preferred using two by four or two by six. One, you know, you have that full bearing going across then. And two, you're not gonna have the plumber or the whoever, or any of your MEPs coming through and going, I don't need this here. And they just knock it out. So um, basically, you're you're saying we put we put squash blocks alongside yeah. of each of the joists so that the squash block goes from the top of the beam up to the top of the joist. That's yeah. in my in my area. That's the way a lot of the the framers do it. Um, and and it depends on really where the best detail. One of the things that I'm going to point out here is people are going to say they've got the nail gun right there. The only amount of nails that should be in that. 
um, block at this moment are two nails, one on each side of the flange going into the plate below, and they should be number eights. Do not toenail, do not go through the side of the flange at the top or anything like that. All you're going to do is split it and you're going to introduce squeaks. Um, what holds that block in place is when you nail your sheathing and glue your sheathing on top of it. And this gets back to what you were mentioning earlier about the web stiffeners and how many nails you put in. As framers with a framing gun, you know that if one nail's good, 30 are better. Um, and it's real specific where, and, and what you're saying, uh, Steve, is here, if you're going to be putting in uh, the nails for the joist down to the plate, well, this goes beyond, this gets a little beyond the panel block, but this, if you're going to be putting the joist to the plate, you're putting 180 toenail on each side at an angle, and it's got to be about an inch and a half or greater from the end of the joist. And Correct. then when you put the rim board on, you're only going to put one 10 D nail into that top flange. And this is where you got to have good aim because you don't want to be off to the edge of the flange and you don't want to, and you don't want to be right where the web meets the flange. You want to be kind of up a little bit. And then there's going to be one in the bottom as well. And that's what one of the things we found and what John Spear is doing here is actually installing the joists first and then putting the rim on second. And that way you get a much better access for accuracy when you're using a nail gun. Yeah, it's something yeah, we have. In that last picture you showed with the the rim board going around, um, a lot of times we were all trained, you want it, you want your seam to land on a joist. Mm. In eye joist framing, we want that seam to be somewhere out in the middle and just back or block it with another piece. Because otherwise now you're gonna try to put four nails <laughs> into two in the top, two in the bottom. And depending on the joist series, uh, we have everything from a 110 flange, which is about inch and a three eighths, all the way up to a 560, which is three and a half inches across. I mean, do the math in between and how much is going into that cross section. Um, again, if you had to do it by hand, you wouldn't put that many in. Remind me, Steve, does Warehouser do uh, LVL flanges as well? We only do LVL flanges. Yeah. We don't. We do not make a solid song. So just something to be aware of with some other manufacturers. I actually prefer the LVL flanges because they split less in those rim board conditions than the solid sawn spruce flanges that you'll get on some of the uh, the other brands. And not just that, you have to also look at it. Nothing against the spruce flange, but you will never carry the same amount of weight over the same distance at the same depth using a spruce flange versus a LVL flange. An LVL flange will always win. Um, the only way that they're going to combat that is by going deeper. And when it comes down to pricing, there's a good chance that it's going to be the same amount. The LVL flange may seem more upfront, but by the time you jump to that next series of spruce flange, it, you could be almost comparable price-wise to get what you actually want in your floor system. One of the things, another kit, you know, one of the things we want to hit today is some of the tips. Um, something that a lot of framers don't realize that they can do, or a lot of even designers of, of floor systems and roof systems, particularly with floor systems, is you don't have to put structural headers in the wall frame. You can utilize the rim joist material as your header. And both the TJI rim joist and the TJI, TJI uh, timber strand products have load ratings. So either singly as a single piece of rim board, if it's a narrow opening, or as my brother's doing here, adding an extra micro lamb uh, layer along with the, the, the rim board, Together, those are acting as a header. And then you can see in the photo below where we have uh, the flange hangers, where all the joists are sitting in the, the flange hanger to uh, carry the load over the, the opening. Um, some people prefer the drop header. I like to put all, as many headers as I can in the floor system because I find I get many fewer uh, drywall cracks 
at the upper corners of the window or the door opening, especially on larger openings? That's a, a technique that we use quite a bit. Um, we have a house right now that the entire, all of the openings on the project are all taken up by the 16 inch LVL rim board around the project. Um, and for us, we really like that because that means that we can insulate that area much better. We can fill the ends of those floor joists with more insulation, whereas we're limited to the thickness of the wall if we put it down at the top of the window opening. And then the other thing is, is I got this from my father, uh, putting them up there in the floor system means that later on in the life of that building, when somebody goes to remodel it, they can do kind of whatever they want. They can turn that window into a door. They can move that window up and they're not restricted by, you know, where you set your header. You already covered it, Ben, but I was going to say, always put your header, your lintel, whatever you want to call it up as high as you can, even while you're doing the build, uh, you know, the client says, you know what, I, I, I really want that eight foot door now. Um, nothing to move it if it's already up in the floor system, you know? Yeah, good point. Yeah, this is, this especially pushes true when you're looking at, let's say you have a really high garage ceiling just because of the lay of the land and people are like, oh, I got to get that header drop down. You don't have any lateral stability in that header. And if you are doing multiply, you lose even more. Um, we have plenty of documentation technology to show out there that like you're all saying get that header up as high as you can and it's going to create a much stronger wall system and carry the loads that are designed and when you're when you're mentioning put the header up as high as you can it's not necessarily putting it up in the floor system it's putting it up against the bottom of that top plate um, and if you're framing conventionally just for, for those of you who haven't bumped into the 2018 or the 2021 code, if you're framing with dimensional lumber, if you don't put your header up against the bottom of the top plate and then build the opening down, you're going to get a span reduction out of any 2x8s, 2x10s, or 2x12s from what you read off the code table. That's because of their new requirement in the 2018 code and future codes for uh, lateral stability of the header. Yeah. And what happens is when you have the two pieces nailed together, as you're putting weight on them, they want to twist and they want to open up. Open up. Um, we have a really good couple of really good videos on how that works. Um, yeah, it, it you can reduce half, even three quarters of of the carrying capacity of that beam when you do like a pony wall on top of it. Yeah. It just becomes a hinge problem. Yep. Uh, Warehouser has uh, to to their acclaim a, a great online. It's now an online web based tool called Forte, where you can go in with a little bit of education on your end, and you can size any of these members for your projects with really basic understanding of what structural loading is, and then it will spit out a document that you can take to your authority having jurisdiction the code department and say, look, this complies with the code requirements for my municipality. And you can essentially bypass having to have an engineer on your project for simpler projects. You know, I can't speak um, more strongly about that tip there uh, about using that that's online software. One of my friends uh, was framing, it was a remodeling job, and uh, just winged it and said, I need an 11, double 11 and 7 eighths uh, LVL to carry a ceiling load. And then the uh, inspector came out and said, show me some engineering on that. So I said, well, let me, and I, I, let me check the software. So I went and I played with it before and I was able to figure out that, yep, it would more than uh, meet the requirement. And then I could print it out. And the inspector said, great, something I can put in the file folder. That's all they were looking for. <laughs> but it saved my friend from having to go, you know, pay several hundred dollars for getting an engineer out there. Yeah, if you're if you're a small like design build firm or something like that, and you may not have projects that have the, the budgets to support a full structural engineer, it's a great little way to kind of get things that are compliant. And it also spits out engineering for sawn lumber as well. So you don't necessarily have to use warehouses uh, material. It'll give you two by 12s, two by eights, all of these commodity lumbers uh, with engineering reports. Yeah, and it it it's one of those things, if there's architects, engineers, or any designers on, we have plenty of online classes. We teach classes on how to use it. 
Um, and for those that are not computer savvy or understand necessarily engineering to the degree that others do, we have forms that fill out, give us the information, we'll ask a couple questions, and if a territory manager, uh, if, if it's above or beyond them, we have uh, internal engineering that can also help take a look at it. Um, one Again, thing we're not here to engineer your entire house from top to bottom, but um, we with let's say it's one of those things. Oh, I want to somebody post it on there about what do we do when we want to drop a tub three inches? Well, we can take a look through software and say, well, we did an 11 and 7 eighths inch floor. What happens if we do nine and a half in that area and then build back up the software that Ben was talking about will allow you to kind of play around with that to come up with. A general idea it's going to tell you what the deflection is it's going to tell you what the the pro rating or the floor rating on the vibrations and what that floor feels like does it feel like you're jumping up and down on concrete or does it feel like you're jumping up and down on a trampoline um and you can you can see in real time little tweaks what happens when we put thicker sheathing on top if we use three quarter we use seven eighths even inch and an eighth is going to stiffen that floor as well as what happens when we put half inch or five eighths jip or sheetrock on the bottom, that's going to also change how that floor reacts. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of science. It's not, I live in a house from the 1700s. I was explaining to one of our designers today, they, they built all the rocks into the foundation, they pulled out of the farm field, they laid some floor joists, they kept coming up with stone. If my walls fell apart, all my floors fall down. Like there is nothing else holding it up. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned uh, that one little thing that I that you kind of breezed by, which was um, changing the joist size in a floor system uh, where you might need to drop a floor down like three inches, going from the 11 to 7 eighths down to the 9 inches. Uh, Mark asked a question early on, maybe half an hour ago, about that with a curbless shower where he needs to drop three inches down to get the slope for the curbless shower and what you would do in that case. And I think the answer there is, well, number one, plan for it <laughs> at the design phase, and then um, either do the software uh, check yourself or have Trust Joyce plan for that. Let them know you need that, and then they can do that evaluation to drop from an 11 and 7 eighths to a 9 Joyce. Maybe you have to go to closer uh, spacing, maybe uh, 12 inches on center or 8 inches on center, but be able to do that so that you're not knocking yourself out of the opportunity to have that curbless shower in a bathroom just because you're using an engineered floor. Yeah, and depending on where it is, we're not talking you've got to do the whole entire bathroom in that height. We could double up like in the picture here. Let's say that was supposed to be a drop shower. Um, obviously, the spacing is a little bit further than 16 on center, but you could probably double up the left and right joist and then head her off the center and then reduce the height going back. We're not talking 15, 20, 30 feet for a three by five shower. We can that, probably create a hole in the area. That's what we're typically seeing is we're seeing a flush beam of an LVL or something like that going to double eye joist either end hung off of those, a smaller joist size. And often what we're seeing is not even reduced uh, spacing on it, but uh, the engineers are saying just put two layers of three quarter subfloor on it, and that's getting them the floor performance that they need in that area. That does change, though. Uh, word of caution if you're dealing with like large format four foot by four foot or four <laughs> foot by eight foot ceramic tiles, be sure that you nail that because they have much, much stricter deflection criteria um, for those tiles. But yeah, it's really simple. You're just headering off and doing the last four feet or so of your joist run for that flush area. Before we move off the uh, the photo you have on the screen, Mike, I just wanted to point out one more thing. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the using the rim joist area as a header when you can, um, but we should also note that you do need to have adequate bearing there for your joists. Um, so if if, it, if you get down to a certain, uh, I forget what the number is, is it an inch and a half of bearing, Mike, at the at your joist ends? Well, you're going to have a hanger. Well, that's what I'm what I'm wondering is if you get to be too skinny, then you, you definitely need to have a hanger, but you may not have to, correct? You need a hanger there anyways to transfer the joist load onto the header. Oh, yeah, the okay. the joist is just hanging off of your toenails into the header. <laughs> yeah, now we're just sitting on the plate. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah they, no, no magical thinking here. Your top plate's not going to bear any load. Yeah. Yeah. But if you were just on a top plate, you do need a minimum of an inch and a half. Inch and a half. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 For end bearing. 
um, going across, if you're doing multi-span, your center bearing has to be a minimum of three and a half inches. Um, this is a tip. And I, I saw Aaron, you would uh, post it on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, uh, putting a, a splooge of, of uh, construction adhesive into the bottom of the hanger where you're dropping the joist down into. Where did you learn that tip? Um, it was probably late, mid or late 90s. And, and I don't know what it was called at the time, but uh, a local supplier basically had a lunch and learn. Like, come on down to the hardware store. And I don't remember if, who the trust uh, joist supplier was, but, uh, you know, it was about reducing squeaks and building a more solid floor. And one of the tips was, let's put a little dollop of PL in the bottom of the hanger and uh, sort of isolate the wood from the metal. Now, the first house that I did with iJoist, uh, nobody told us about this, and we ended up with squeaks. The second house we did with iJoyce, one of the guys on the crew said, let's just put the construction adhesive in there just to, you know, isolate it, like you're saying. And it worked and done it ever since. Now I'm I'm, I'm using acoustical sealant just because it stays a little gooier in it. But, um, but the same thing, yeah. The other thing I found, too, is even in cases where we did put the construction adhesive in the, the bottom of the hanger, um, we were still getting some squeaks. And what it wasn't because of the, because I could check it when it was in the framing stage and we walked on the subfloor, we could hear the squeak. It was the end of the joist against moving just a little bit in the seat of the hanger. The, the hanger deflected a tiny bit and it was because the joist was cut extremely tight and and, and rubbed against the uh, LVL that it was hung from. So the solution there was we started cutting our joists like a, an eighth of an inch short so that we didn't have the contact between them. Uh, Mike, I've heard uh, other solutions where people are taking a piece of flashing tape and putting it on the beam before setting the joist in. That's Something to note though, uh, this I learned from Glenn Matthewson, if you cut them short of the beam, there is a reduction table uh, and the carrying capacity of them. So you actually have to derate the, the, the hanger carrying capacity because it introduces a turning moment into the system. And so what's interesting, most squeaks are metal on metal and metal on wood. Very rarely, unless it's so, so tight, um, like you, like when you're like a, a mortise and tenon where you get that squeaking, very rarely is wood on wood a squeak point. Mm -hmm. Um, what's interesting to see in hangers, like I have some builders that refuse to use top mount hangers because they think that they squeak more than face mount hangers. Um, what I find interesting of just hangers in general, whether you use, uh, we, we're, I'm a big proponent of Simpson, that's the one that we use in our area. Where do, let's ask on the question, where do you put nails in a hanger? All the holes. No, all the holes. <laughs> Only in the round holes. Any other hole that is in a hanger is a production hole. Just because the hole's there doesn't, it has to be a round hole. Unless um, it's a diamond Be hole. careful, Steve. You're about to get, you're about to get <laughs> holes. Be careful. <laughs> there, there are holes that are stamped in the hanger, and sometimes they're diamond shaped, and they are for additional load requirements. So you got to check the hardware information oh, maybe not for the top to me i've never heard that so oh I, yeah yeah I, yeah I, sorry everyone that everybody learns something so that's my learning it i know i learned it. that that's a hard 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 way all right <laughs> how was that uh is a great big mcmansion that i framed probably early 2000 and there was a 18 foot entryway with uh a girder truss and there was hangers up there for trusses going the other way and the inspector came in with a pair of binoculars <laughs> and looked up at my hangers you know and... you're in trouble when they have binoculars <laughs> well apparently this was like a common problem that he'd been running into on these this particular style of house and he wanted to see uh my trust diagrams and the engineering and uh 
I didn't have the appropriate hole snailed. So, uh, you know, out comes the extension ladder and, uh, you know, basically I'm, I'm leaving this job is done, but no, uh, backtracking. So yeah, definitely for extra loads. Sometimes you got to fill the diamonds. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if they're the big production holes, yeah, you don't need a nail in those ones that are a quarter inch diameter. It's usually the diamond shaped ones or the extra holes uh, for the extra load requirements. Right. Although if you're doing a renovation, sometimes you will find roofing nails in those large ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Um, one thing, Ben, you had mentioned what, um, what Glenn had taught, had, had pointed out to you about the load reduction for the hangers and with uh, both Simpson strong tie and my tech, you're allowed up to one eighth of an inch from your, um, your joist to your carrying member. Um, anything bigger than an eighth, that's when they start derating the, the load capacity, both for uplift and for gravity loads. Yeah. Admittedly, I think the conversation that sprung out of was an architect uh, specifying a quarter inch space. Oh, wow. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. As an architect, we both know, Mike, we can talk about that another time. And at, at a quarter of an inch with Simpson strong tie, you have a 60, uh, you, you have a, a, a 40% reduction in the load. It's significant. It's like almost half. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah. So no more cutting your joy short. <laughs> um, now this is a detail that, that, uh, we started using early on it's something we came up with and i don't know how other people approach this but if you have interior partition walls that are parallel to the joist direction we would take pieces of plywood or osb span between the flanges just put one six penny nail on the bottom and then we would put a like say a two by eight uh plate which would pretty much fare out with the thickness of a flange and then we would build our partition wall under that. Is there anything, Mark, uh, Steve, that, that says this is a bad idea? Because I've never seen it in a construction detail that in the, in the trust choice manual. So a couple comments on what's going on here. I don't know. Uh, the the joist, that's old, old joist. Let's just it say it's very old. That was that's not the, even ours. That's a Boise right. Cascade product and it's yeah. got a plywood web. So yep. Let's just skip that. <laughs> um, just take a look at the picture. That's Mike. <laughs> yeah, notice <laughs> notice the color of my hair. This was this yeah. was uh, like ninety two or something. Um, no, not even eighty eight or eighty nine. Yeah. So technically, if you read through the literature, any partition walls that are not bearing that are going in are not supposed to be tight underneath the joist. Obviously, we don't all frame that way. Um, you're not going to go necessarily through and cut your studs um, shorter just to keep the load from going into it. That being said, um, I'm not saying this is a bad detail. I've never seen it done this way. Um, I mean, possibly if you were doing something in a basement for fire blocking reasons, it's, it's a good detail. Um, the big thing you don't want to do is angle the gun too much where you're nailing, where that eye joist comes together into the flange, you have like it might be kind of hard to see, but you can see like where you don't want to come in on an angle. You have a lot less material there and that's where they're more prone to split. Um, a lot of times just framing up underneath and instead of shooting straight in, shoot on an X pattern so that as things shrink or move, an X isn't going to squeak, but going straight up and down, it, it acts like a piston that's where you're going to get your squeak method. I mean, something like this, I would really want to put in front of our engineering department and say, Hey, what are your thoughts? So I just to throw this out, since we're on this, the topic there, Steve, I, I live in the land of strapping and we would strap out that entire, yeah. the entire underside of all of that before we would even think about partitions. There, there's zero issues with that. As, as far as I know, no, it, you'd be furring down the ceiling that we'd look at it at that point. Um, it's just an underside connection. Um, yeah. No different than nailing your sheetrock or anything else into it. Um, your spacing is fine. Again, it, it comes down to your nail length and your gauge and how many you're, yeah. you're putting in. 
this is the time where if two is good, three is not better. Um, I threw a couple of slides in just to point out different ways that uh, you can frame up ridges. Uh, one of the things with eye joist roof framing that's different than dimensional framing. With dimensional framing, you put up a a uh, a ridge board, which is generally non-structural because you got opposite jo uh, rafters that are meeting up there. It's really just there to balance the opposing rafters. But with a, a truss joist system, you're going to need a structural ridge. So that can be done where it's flush in with the um, eye joist like this, where it's dropped down. It, it more or less looks like a ridge board. It can also be done where you're dropping that beam below the the uh the rafters and then you're lapping the rafters or joining them up at the top over the beam um and it can also be done with and what i'll be doing on my house when i build it next year it will be a structural wall that runs down the middle of the house and then essentially instead of having a beam now we've got our joists coming from opposite directions Alternatively, down at the eave wall, you have a couple of different ways of approaching that. Mike showed some pictures earlier of a standard like seat cut, like we're mostly familiar with, with uh, you know, sawn lumber framing. Additionally, there are Simpson brackets that you can use. So you just run the, uh, the joist out with no seat cut on it, and the bracket connects it to the top of the wall plate. Or you can do a canted rip where you rip the, the top plate or an, an additional top plate to the angle, the complementary angle of your roof pitch so that it turns it to that angle and then you just nail down straight through uh, into that. So there's a couple of different ways to handle it down at the eave wall locations. Ben, you had sent me a bunch of pictures. Do you wanna um, sure. point anything out on those? I've got them in yeah. the sequence you had. So we like, uh, I focus primarily on doing low energy, high efficiency buildings. So one of the reasons we like iJoyce is it allows us to get really thick insulation cavities. This was a passive house retrofit where we did a, an iJoyce hip layover on top of the structure so that we could get 18 inches worth of insulation into there. Uh, and if you click through, Mike, and you can see the web stiffeners there. The engineer let us just, uh, you know, fasten nail through without any hangers there into those locations. Um, and then you can start doing things like this. This is an exterior retrofit where we're adding, uh, I think these were 14s on the outside of the building to create really big, thick, robust insulation cavities for, you know, low energy consumption. Um, so, so somebody had asked a question earlier about using the eye joist in a Larson truss fashion. And that's what you've done here, where you've applied the eye joist over the wall surface to pad that out for the insulation. And the beauty is, is some of the, the real energy nerds did modeling on this a number of years ago. And I think it's once you hit about the nine inch depth of eye joist, uh, the, the thermal bridging is essentially non-existent anymore. So we're now completely disconnected from inside to outside. We don't have any thermal bridging. Uh, it, alternatively, you can use manufactured trusses or build your own site built Larson trusses. For us, these are great because we can use the smaller series and get them right from the lumber yard and make nice big thick fat fluffy walls so the web that's that's that web osb that's in the middle that doesn't bridge any th thermally conductive yeah yeah beyond i think it was about nine inches at that point there's so much loss to the cavity that it's no longer conducting through because that was one of the early complaints uh in the energy nerve world is they're like it's a thermal bridge inside to outside and it's it's not beyond a certain depth wow that's an interesting setup. I've never, so you're fully framed on the inside. Now you're just using Correct. the joist as basically a standoff. Yep. Yep. Now do you, in, in this photo, you've got the, the joists on the outside applied vertically. You've got the, the rafters, the eye joist as rafters. Are you, would you be putting uh, an ex uh, an eve extension added on afterwards over this? yeah i had some photos that i could have shared but essentially what we do is this gets a, a cross vented uh assembly on top of it. it's like a european sarking method so we're strapping parallel with the the run of the joist and then across it perpendicularly and we uh, rip down three inch lvl outriggers that get applied to be cantilevered out you know if it's a two foot overhang we make six foot uh outriggers and they get fastened down through into the top of the TJI 
Uh, there's a, a weather membrane in between there, so it's vapor open and airtight. And then, at the risk of of going into the weeds on this picture, um, do you, are you required to do anything down there for for draft stopping? Because um, I mean, essentially, you're creating a balloon frame wall on the outside of the house. No, because cellulose beyond 16 inches of depth is a fire stop. Okay. Draft stop. Yep. Well, Trust Joyce must love you on a job like this because you're using them for everything. <laughs> we just they just send the truck straight from the distributor. It doesn't even go to the lumber yard. Uh, but for us, like right now, like our our codes in our climate zone are pushing for R60 roof assemblies, and if we're trying to stay away from spray foam in order for us to get the cavity, we're then into a parallel core truss or an eye joist like this, and um, it's it's how we how we. Uh, you know, hit that code requirement without using a bunch of spray foam in our assemblies. So, Justin, have you seen any questions that have come up that you want to highlight before we run out of time? Yeah, there's been a couple of questions. I'm, I'm just going to start. This one is kind of top of my screen right now. So we'll start there. Um, just a, a, we want to talk a little bit about um, framing an opening between joists, let's say, for an attic, uh, uh, attic scuttle or um, a stairway, uh, just kind of the basics of what to know there. So, I mean, if you're going in, a lot of times it's already going to be called out on your layout, um, depending on if it's a scuttle hole or uh, it really depends on what that space is used for is going to depend on the loading that's applied. So if it's a, a scuttle hole is going to have and the, the roof ridge is under, I think, 42 inches, I think we can go to like a 10 live and a 10 dead load. Um, at that point, we probably are only looking at maybe packing out the webs on the on either of the joists and kind of headering it off. Um, as we get further up, pull down stairs with a higher ridge is going to be more weight. And then once you have walk up staircase, that's considered full living space. You're going to be looking at uh, standard 10 and 30 bedroom loading uh, per code for most areas to, to do that. Um, at the end of the day, there is no like rule of thumb, um, because we don't know what is actually weighted in there. So to say, oh, you just double up this or a three and a half, 11 and seven eighths, every instance is a little different. Um, if you're building the same house over and over and over again, well, maybe it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's very similar to just uh, conventional framing is you're gonna be doubling members or adding a, uh, an engineered member and then hanging your you know headers off of that. So it's and not much different. And do you guys have preferences um, personally on um, saddle style hangers for eye joists versus um, kind of a conventional, uh, you know, the like you would see in a, a, a dimensional lumber uh, floor system? Do you have a, a favorite way to go? Mike's giving me the confusing face. I must have said something wrong. <laughs> no, you're saying a preferred Not way. for that specific application. I'm saying in general. I think what he's alluding to is, do we prefer like face mounted hangers or top yes. mounted hangers? Um, I like, if I have a large crew, I like top mounted hangers because personally I find less goes wrong. Um, it, it never fails. It doesn't matter how hard I try uh, unless I, and even, you know what, sometimes even if I set every hanger myself, uh, sometimes you got to go back and adjust something when you're just making sure you know, that floor is going to be dead flat. Um, that's just a preference. Uh, yeah. Top mounted hangers, usually I have better luck with. The only thing I don't like about top mounted hangers and a rough opening for like a stairway is if your crew doesn't set the depth of the saw blade, a mm. 16th of an inch shy or a 32nd of an inch shy of the bottom of that subfloor sheathing, they'll zing right through that that top flange. And now you're trying to flip, uh, slip one in or do a face mounted hanger. And that retrofit's a pain in the butt. So be really careful when you're cutting out openings with top flange hangers, not, not to cut through that hanger flange. Yep. Exactly to Aaron's point, we typically prefer top mount hangers because they're faster. Yep. Um, can we, uh, one thing that didn't come up, but I just wanted to, to throw this out there and, uh, is, is there anything that we should be talking about here when it comes to the role of subfloor adhesive, um, to the overall structure of the finished floor? So I think it's important for people to understand that, 
uh, these I joists and, and LVL beams or whatever type of engineer beams you use, th this is a whole system that's designed to work to achieve a load rating or a, a certain stiffness as a whole package. Um, and is there anything to, that you'd want to talk about there? I, I think you nailed it. It's a system. So depending on the design, what your system calls for, um, you know, you can always substitute up, but you can never substitute down if you want to meet the intent of that system. Uh, you know, for us, typically, you know, it's going to be three quarter plywood or three quarter Advantac and everything is going to be glued and screwed no matter what floor system we're using. Um, it might only call for five eighths but sort of our minimum standard in-house is three-quarter. Yeah. Glue is mm -hmm. cheap. Fixing squeaks is expensive. <laughs> and another thing that's good about the adhesive, too, is, um, and it gets to what Mark pointed out, excuse me, Steve pointed out earlier about the nailing. You don't want to over-nail these things. And if you're ordinarily putting down regular subfloor and you're just shooting it off at four or six inches on center that don't you don't want to do that the glue let the glue do its work put down just the minimum amount of nails so you're not going to split any of those flanges uh, not just that if if you read through a lot of the literature ours competitors as soon as you remove glue from the equation you lose right off the bat a minimum of span that that connectivity and the ability for it to work as a system gives you the long lengths that you have there. Um, we have tech bulletins on that. We, we know there's proprietary fasteners out there that claim they can do the same thing as a screw and glue together. Um, glue needs to be there. It, it needs to be applied correctly. Somebody posted up too much. Yeah. Too much glue also is a problem. Um, there's so many different out there. Um, there's proprietary glues. They work with subfloor. They work with everything. There's a reason that they have how, how big the bead should be. Why you're not applying it when it's wet. Why you're not applying when it's frozen. Why, like Going against the label doesn't mean that you got the job done so you're a hero. Going against the label is going to just set you up for problems down the road. Something we didn't mention is, is why would we choose an I joist? Why would we <laughs> choose a TJI? Uh, and just like take it back to basics, uh, you know, I've been at this at 25 years and I've watched the quality of lumber decrease dramatically in the span of my career. I'm sure Mike has seen that exponentially compared to what I've seen. Um, for us, we're getting, you know, these designs where they have big, wide open spans. We have clients that are expecting high performance, non-bouncy floors. So for us, iJoyce allow us to deliver a better product. We get flat, we get large spans, we get you know good stiffness, everything's repeatable. We're not culling lumber. You know, our framers charge us more to frame with uh sawn lumber floor systems than they do with TJIs because they have to sit and flip and crown and cull material. Whereas TJIs, they just roll them right out, cut them to length, and they start stacking the floor. So and from, an, from an, uh, an ecological side, for you also have to look at how we're saving lumber. It's going to take three trees to do the same amount that one tree can make in an eye joist. Um, the amount of fiber that's used is so much less. Um, yes, it's more expensive, but it's also engineered to do much more than that 2 by 10 or 2 by 12 could do. Absolutely. If you, you know, you've got a floor plan and you've got a 26 foot span, um, find a two by 12 that's going to do that. It, it, not going to happen. You have to go to, you know, something engineered. Uh, what so exactly double what two by 12s or two by 12s right now, or like, you know, I'd rather buy gold teeth than buy two by 12s. <laughs> Um, one question came in, uh, Greg, I apologize that I saw this earlier and, and missed it on this. Uh, um, gentlemen, this question is about uh, when adding an LVL alongside an eye joist, what's the proper fastening and is there anything else to, to know about that connection? Skip the eye joist. Just mm -hmm. double up the, oh, skip the eye joist. It's redundant at that point. And it's going to be to to use the, the trope. It, it depends, like it depends on what the structural situation is. 
Like, it's hard to say that, like, you know, fastening six screws is what you need for your situation. It totally depends on what you're trying to achieve with that LVL or with that, that, that structural set of circumstances. Well, there are situations, though, where the plans will call for two iJoyce set side by side. So mm -hmm. when we talk about that fastening setup. You don't nail them. Don't mm -hmm. nail them together. Mm -hmm. Nope. The only time you nail eye joists together is if you need to pack them out with backer blocks in order to hang another beam into it mm -hmm. because it's transferring the load through it. Um, what's interesting is if you were using a 560 joist and you put an inch and a half, you blocked it out, it's actually going to leave a tiny little space in the bottom of the joist and your building inspector is going to go around with a business card and make sure you did it and they'll stick a business card up in there to make sure that there's blocking um i've been on jobs where people have missed it um at the end of the day unless it specifically calls out by the engineer or it's some sort of repair to a damaged joist um there's no reason to connect the two what's the danger of connecting the two squeaks and splits squeaks? Yeah. Yeah. they're going to be connected on top your floor sheathing goes over, like not directly connected, but they're adjacent to each other. They're going to move, but not like this. They'll move like this. Um, all right. Anybody else? Last call for questions before we wrap things up. Somebody posted up there, and we'll just talk about this real quick. Um, what's great about an eye joist and a TJI especially are the massive holes that yeah. we can put inside of this joist. So right now with 560 series, 11 and 7 eighths and bigger, in an eight foot clear span, I can take from flange to flange, 24 inches out of the center on a uniformly loaded beam. You're taking, so 24, you're taking a, a, a quarter of the web completely out. Um, I did uh, a fine home building a couple a year or so ago where somebody was like, well, how big is a, a 24 inch hole? And I think I had a 16 or an 18 inch eye joist and I pulled it over and like stepped through it. Um, <laughs> it's going to do just about anything you need. Uh, just as a tip for anybody running projects where you're framing with eye joist floor systems, uh, Weyerhaeuser has a single page document that shows the allowable holes for uh, their eye joists. I print a couple of those out and I stick them on the job at the beginning of MEP rough-ins so that nobody has any questions about what's allowable because it's still like, this is like the dark arts to people. They're like, you can't put holes in eye joists, no way. And it, it's incredible how many holes and the size of them you can't put in. Something to bear in mind if you're also uh, framing with eye joists is they have knockouts for being able to run uh, MEP services through. When you're doing your layout for cutting your joists, be mindful of where you're pulling your layout from so that you keep those lined up. Um, so if your plumber does want to use those knockouts to run water lines through or something like that, they're not getting halfway through their run and finding that you put one in the wrong spot. And then, you know, first Ben, you don't need to print those sheets out. We, the uh, tech bull, it's not a tech bulletin, but it's, um, what number did I have written down? Uh, 9,015, uh, who's your territory manager? Don't know off the top of my head. Oh, that's not good. Um, well, I'll find out who it is and I'll make sure that he brings these for you like Santa Claus because I had, we just did a house 25,000 square feet where the builder put, and I know because of the green screen, you don't see the green here, but he literally hung one in every single room and they're double-sided for English. The other thing to note is this is, if any of the literature that you pick up from Warehouser, you can build a house if you follow it. I don't care if it's eye joist, if it's beams, studs, whatever we're doing. But if you need to do something that's outside of this literature, that's where you need to call one of us and we can look at it and say, oh no, we could put a bigger hole in that beam because of such and such. And that's where that Forte web comes in. And I will post down there a link to uh, what we call the specifiers center. And when you go into that, the specification center, it's going to have a whole map of North America and it's going to have, it's going to be broken into regions. And when you click on there, um, all the territory managers are going to pop up. So you're going to see my face. You're going to see seven more of me in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and just that mid Atlantic region that do the same job, our telephone numbers, information. We all put out a lot of stuff, a lot of different material of things that we see to help combat against and make it an easier journey. 
um, especially as a lot of us age out of this industry, a lot of knowledge is getting left uh, with us. Um, nothing's worse than the new guy that's coming in and wants to show the boss when he goes to lunch that he's going to cut all the holes and get ready for the afternoon. And it's like, oh, could you have just waited? <laughs> we, I just saw in a forum that I'm a part of uh, somebody come in that the, the HVAC contractors had run the ERV ducts through like the last eight inches of the joists and they essentially had to replace the entire floor system at the HVAC contractor's expense. So it's just, it's simple. You just got to put that, that document and Steve, I'll take a stack of those any day of the week. Cause I do, I just print out and make sure it's on there. They're really easy to follow. You can get away with a whole heck of a lot. You just got to let people know what they are. Well, terrific. Um, uh, guys, this recording is going to be available for everybody. Um, uh, you'll see Kelly's comment in the webinar chat. Uh, there, there should be uh, an email coming out to everyone that was here, um, and it'll also be available on demand at the link that Kelly posted. Um, thanks to everybody, Mike, Aaron, Ben, Steve. You guys are great. Um, I think, I mean, I definitely learned some things here, um, as, I, as I always do, uh, and uh, looking forward to the next one. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, FHB. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.